St. Mark's, may the peace of Christ be with you all. If you are joining us for the first time this morning, we are in the middle of a Lenten sermon series, and for this year, the theme for our series is on the seven deadly sins. Last Sunday, after worship service, a few people came up to me to, to share and to talk about how much you've enjoyed the series so far, and the sins that we've looked at in the series up to today is the sin of pride, the sin of envy, and the sin of anger. Today, we are looking at a fourth sin, fourth deadly sin, that's the sin of sloth. And to start us off, I'd like to ask by a show of hands or by verbal acclamation, how many of you struggle with the sin of sloth? A few of you. Or let's put it another way, how many of you, for, for you, uh, the sin of sloth might be in, in the top three? Anyone here? Yeah, a few. As I imagine, um, uh, there, there were a, a few of us here um, who, uh, ready to confess, we, we are sinners. Thank you for your honesty. Perhaps the fact that you are all here this morning on the Sunday where daylight savings begin, begins or began, uh, the fact that even though you all lost an hour of sleep but still made it to church, seems like there's no one slothful here this morning. It's all the people who slept in. They're going to start showing up in about 45 minutes, so let's talk about them before they get here. Many people are actually surprised that sloth actually made it onto the list of the seven deadly sins. And I read an article this past week where the author said something like, sloth? Really? Who in this day and age has the time for sloth? And, and I couldn't agree anymore. If anything, we're guilty of exactly the opposite of sloth. We are a busy generation. We are a busy society with very little time to sit down. We are busy doing homework. We are busy applying to colleges. We are busy interviewing for jobs. We are busy raising children. We are busy dropping them off to school. We are busy taking them to all kinds of different practices. Then we ourselves are busy heading off to work. We are busy trying to meet deadlines. We are busy attending meetings in person and on Zoom. We are so busy that one of the biggest reasons why people stop coming to church is because Sunday is finally the day we can rest. Perhaps for some of you, it's not the sin of sloth that should be on your list of sins, but the sin of being too busy that you need to be mindful of during the season of Lent. There's a quote from an author, her name is Rebecca DeYoung. She wrote a book on the seven deadly sins and in regards to this, what I'm talking about, she wrote, most of the world's troubles seem to come from people who are too busy. And she wrote that to suggest these days it's the opposite of sloth that should be on the list of seven deadly sins. All this to say, the sin of sloth is one of those sins that some people don't take seriously. Case in point, back in 1987, a well-known magazine called Harper's Magazine did a spoof on the seven deadly sins, sort of like a parody. And here's a picture of the cover of that magazine. I think now they put a person's face on it, but this was the cover of that particular issue, that article, it was on the seven deadly sins. And for the sin of sloth, they had a very beautiful picture, which appears to be the Garden of Eden. The next picture. Here it is. <clears throat> you can't see the fine details, but it looks like a kind of a foresty picture. There's all kind of animals in the foreground. And right there in the center of the picture, there's, it's, it's too small of a detail, but there are two figures, Adam and Eve, and they're looking up at a tree with a, a serpent there. And right in the middle of the picture, there's this interesting quote. It reads, If the original sin had been sloth, we'd still be in paradise. <laughs> what? 
if the original sin had been sloth, we'd still be in paradise. Parody aside, that quote makes you think, doesn't it? That's how serious or not so serious some people are about sloth. It's one of those sins that could have kept us in the garden. The Italians even have this fantastic phrase, dolce far niente, translation, the sweetness of doing nothing. And if Adam and Eve, can you imagine if they were Italian? <laughs> we wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> so what does the Bible say about sloth? Let's take a look. There are two short passages from the book of Proverbs, which read very similarly. The first one is from Proverbs chapter 6. The other one is from chapter 24. This morning, I'm going to be reading the message translations. So rather than the, the pew Bibles, you may want to follow along on screen. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6 through 11. Hear God's word for us today. You lazy fool. Look at the ant. Watch it closely. Let it teach you a thing or two. Nobody has to tell it what to do. All summer it stores up food. At harvest it stockpiles provisions. So how long are you going to laze around doing nothing? How long before you get out of bed? A nap here, a nap there, a day off here, a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do you know what comes next? Just this. You can look forward to a dirt poor life, poverty, your permanent house guest. Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 34. One day I walked by the field of an old lazy bones and then past the vineyard of a slob. They were overgrown with weeds, thick with thistles, all the fences broken down. I took a long look and pondered what I saw. The fields preached me a sermon, and I listened. A nap here, a nap there, a day off here, a day off there. Sit back, take it easy. Do you know what comes next? Just this. You can look forward to a dirt poor life with poverty as your permanent house guest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Oxford Dictionary defines the word sloth as a noun. The first definition reads like this, the reluctance to work or make effort, laziness. And the second defini definition is a slow-moving tropical American mammal that hangs upside down from branches of trees using its long limbs and hooked claws. I think we could all accept and agree on these two definitions. And just in case there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know what a sloth looks like, here's a, a picture. This one in particular is a three-toed, three-toed, three-clawed sloth and is native to Central and South America. Of the seven deadly sins, the sin of sloth has its own spirit animal if you will. Let me share a few fun facts about sloths. You might not know this. There are actually six different species of sloths. Some are two-toed, some are three-toed. One is actually on the endangered list. Sloths spend most of their lives hanging upside down from trees and on average will spend 18 to 20 hours a day sleeping. Does that sound enticing? <laughs> and because sloths hang upside down for most of their lives, they have 46 ribs compared to humans who only have 24, and that's to keep all their organs in place. Fun fact. With sloths, everything is slow. They move only 13 feet a minute. They only take six breaths a minute. Compared to us, we take around 12 on average. Even digestion is very slow, obviously, because they don't spend a lot of energy. 
Here's another fun fact. Sloths only need to go to the bathroom once a week. In order to do that, they have to climb down that tree, which takes them about all week. They head to the forest floor, and that's where they take care of business. Okay. When you think of the word sloth, it's one of those fun words where the definition and the animal go perfectly hand in hand. Some of you may recall the movie, the animation movie Zootopia. The humor is not lost on viewers who've ever gone to the DMV. Here's a picture, just a clip from that movie where all the workers behind the counter at the DMV are staffed by sloths. And that movie just so deliciously pokes fun at how slow everything works and moves at the DMV. Thanks for the pictures. So, how did the sin of sloth make it onto the list of seven deadly sins? How did such a cute, furry little animal that sleeps most of the day make it to the, to the top seven? It's a good question. In order to answer that question, it helps to go back to the original community from where this sin was an issue. I shared in the first sermon in this series that the list of the seven deadly sins wasn't put together by the modern contemporary church, but rather the list of seven sins came about back in the fourth century by a group of people, basically monks, who lived in spiritual communities. They weren't called monks properly back then, or at least not by themselves, and these spiritual communities would later inspire the creation of monasteries. Now, in these monasteries, it's not like the monks stayed in their rooms all day and just prayed all day, nor did they go to chapel and chant all day. Sure, prayer and worship were, were central activities in, in the life of these monasteries, but still they had to feed themselves, they had to clothe themselves just like everyone else. So every single member of these communities were assigned daily chores or tasks. Some worked the land, some took care of the animals, while some cooked and cleaned. Some of these monasteries became so good at these activities and what they did and made that people sought out their products. And even still to some day, there are famous monasteries that are known for their, their food products, their, their wines, their cheeses, their breads, their honeys. There's even one famous for their coffee beans. A few years ago, my wife and I, we were traveling in Madrid. There's a, a famous monastery called Corpus Christi Las Cabaneras, where the nuns there are famous for these secret cookies that they sell to the public. Here's a picture of a box of these secret cookies. But to find these cookies, you have to navigate through these alleyways, these unmarked doors you enter through, which is actually not hard to find because you just follow all the, the tourists. When you finally find the secret location to get a sample of these secret cookies, there's this nondescript uh, window, if you could go to the next picture, and you open the, the little panel, and there's this revolving little thing inside where you put your money, you close the door, and a few minutes later, you open the door, and there's your cookies with, with your change. You actually never interact with the nuns face to face. Like I said, some monasteries are, are known for their cookies, like this one. Other monasteries are known for other food items, but all of that takes effort and work. Living in a monastery or a cloister was no vacation, and everyone had a job to do to keep things running smoothly. When it was time to get up, everyone got up. When it was time to pray, everyone prayed. When it was time to sleep, everyone slept, but when the sun came up, everyone was supposed to be busy doing their assigned chores. And that's when some monks started to slack off. They were tempted to let the others do the work. And that's where the sin of sloth entered the picture. 
Evagrius Ponticus. He, he was the fourth century monk, desert father, who is credited as the, the origin of this list of seven deadly sins. Listen to what he wrote about this particular sin. The demon of sloth is the noonday demon attacking the monk about 10 a.m. in the morning. Remember, for these monks, the day started at 2 a.m. in the morning for morning prayers. So by 10 a.m., these monks have already been awake. By 8 a.m., they've been awake for eight hours, and by 10 a.m., the sun was already starting to rise up high in the sky. The, their muscles were already sore from having done morning chores. Their stomachs were empty from having not eaten for a while, and the greatest temptation was to let others do the work while they themselves stole away for a nap. So a few centuries later, in the seventh century, Pope Gregory, he applied this sin to life outside of the monastery and said the sin of sloth doesn't just apply to these monks, but to anyone who is looking for the easy way out. Then a few centuries later, Thomas Aquinas, uh, he expanded the sin as a sin not only against community and your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, but also a sin against God. By this time, the church defined sloth this way. The slothful person is unwilling to do what God wants because of the effort it takes to do it. On the front cover of your Sunday bulletins, we've had this artwork for a few weeks now. It's the famous painting of the seven deadly sins by Hieronymus Bosch. And the panel that illustrates the sin of sloth is in the one o'clock position. Now, instead of asking you to turn it around and pull out magnifying glasses, here's the panel rotated properly and blown up. Here's a zoomed in picture so we can get a good look at the details. When Bosch painted this panel, he didn't provide a written description, so it was up to the viewer to interpret what was going on. Most art critics will explain what's going on in this panel is there's a man right in the center of the panel, most likely a monk, sitting in a chair in his study. He is leaning back with his head tilted, his eyes closed, and his head is supported by a pillow. There behind the monk stands a nun. In one hand, she holds a Bible, and in the extended hand, she is holding rosary beads as if in an attempt, an effort to remind the monk, hey, you need to get back into the word of God. You need to start praying again. I found a slightly different interpretation with kind of a humorous tone. Quote, Sister Mary is unsuccessful in waking up a fellow nun from her slumber in time to go to church. Miss Lazybones is propped up by her extra fluffy pillow and remains asleep, showing no interest in attending church or doing anything but sleep. In the grand scheme of things, she should probably remain asleep because she will soon find no peace in hell. Not, not entirely the same, but not entirely different, except for the gender of the main person. There's a few other details in the picture that are worth noting that ties in with the sin of sloth. Notice to the far right, there's a, there's a warm fireplace inviting the, the monk to deeper sleep. There at the feet of the monk, there's a, a dog curled up. And I don't know if you could see it because it's so small, but above the fireplace, there is a candle which seems to be out. And so we, we zoomed in on the picture so that you can see this. I read something this past week that emphasized this particular detail. And the author said that oftentimes in religious artwork, a candle or a flame represents the presence of God. But notice here in the picture, the candle is out, and the monk is too lazy to get up 
to relight his candle. And so with the sin of sloth, there's this idea that the fire of God has gone out. Dramatic effect. So this is the result of the sin of sloth. The fire of God has gone out. The spirit of God has been extinguished. Sloth isn't just about this slow-moving animal. Sloth isn't just about wanting to stay in bed a little longer. It isn't just about being lazy, but it's when your spiritual fire or your spiritual passion has gone completely out. It's when your fire no longer burns. It's when your passion has grown cold. It's when you are no longer on fire for the Lord, as they say. Someone once said, the sin of sloth is the sin of not caring anymore. Do you remember in the story where Jesus fed 5,000 people, there was a moment right before Jesus performed the miracle where Jesus turned to the disciples and asked them what we ought to do. The responses from the disciples varied. One disciple named Philip questioned if they had enough funds to feed everyone. Another disciple named Andrew went out looking for scraps, but another disciple said, send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. All four Gospels never tell us the name of that particular disciple, but it sure sounded like he didn't want to be inconvenienced, that he didn't care that the people went hungry. Or consider in the parable of the Good Samaritan, we are surprised to find out that the hero of the story was none other than the Samaritan who, who went way out of his way to take care of the injured man. But what was the excuse for the priest and the Levite who completely ignored the injured man? Commentaries quickly point out that, that here's their excuse. Had they stopped to render aid to the bloodied and injured man, that would have disqualified themselves from serving in the temple. But could it possibly be that they no longer felt any more compassion and that the person lying there half dead was just another statistic? The sin of sloth shows up many places in Scripture in that particular parable as an excuse for not getting involved the sin of sloth also showed up right before jesus did miracles as an excuse for not wanting to help so how about for us how do we know if the sin of sloth is one of the seven deadly sins that we are struggling with how do we know if this is the one we need to confess this morning Being in full-time ministry keeps me busy for most of the week. But compared to other professions in regards to hours of work, I can't complain. It's not like attorneys who some of them work 80 hours a week or ER doctors who are on call around the clock. But every now and then when I get asked to do something, attend a meeting or show up to a function and I want to get out of it, there's a magical phrase I'll say to get out of that commitment. It's the phrase, I'm sorry, I have a prior engagement. (laughs) Well, I just outed myself. If you hear that from me in the future, you're going to wonder. And if that one doesn't work, or I've used it too often that week, I could always use the backup excuses, which is my family for not showing up to something. My daughter is sick. My my wife needs the car. There's a, a plumbing issue at home, which is kind of a different sin altogether. If you are guilty of making excuses, you are probably also guilty of committing the sin of sloth. There's a job site called careerbuilder.com. Some of you may have used it or heard of it. Every year they reach out to managers who have used their services where they send out a little survey asking them to respond. On that survey, there's this fun question. 
What is the most unbelievable excuse you've heard from an employee who called in sick? These are actual responses from last year. One employee said her pressure cooker exploded, which scared her sister so so she had to stay at home. Another employee said her roots were showing so she needed to keep her hair appointment because she looked like a mess. Another employee said he ate cat food instead of tuna and was deathly ill, while another employee said she wasn't sick but her pet llama was. (laughs) True responses that employers heard why their employees called in sick. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus told the parable of the great banquet where people came up with excuses not to show up to work but from having to attend this banquet, the first excuse. I just bought a field and I must see it. Please excuse me. Second excuse. I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. The third excuse. I just got married so I can't come. All were valid excuses which got them out of having to attend the banquet. But Jesus told the parable to say that those who are slothful aren't just missing a day of work or missing out on a great party, but will also miss out at the feast in the kingdom of God. Second way to know if the sin of sloth is one you yourself is struggling with is If you notice about yourself that there's a lack of urgency, if you notice you are becoming complacent, if you notice you're never in a hurry about things that are spiritually important. Back in 1957, a company called West Clock uh, made an alarm clock with a particular nifty invention. We have a picture of this. This is the first of its kind where on the top of the clock there was this little lever, on one side five minutes, on the other side ten minutes, and so when your alarm went off, if you pushed the lever to one side or the other, you could extend your sleep for five or ten minutes longer. That's when the snooze button was invented, 1956. And ever since then, people who don't want to get up, people who want to stay in bed, or people who weren't in a hurry to start the day, all you had to do was hit the snooze button. I'm guilty of that. And these days, you can hit the snooze button all morning long. (laughs) C.S. Lewis once wrote in his book entitled The Screwtape Letters, a story about how one day Satan got together with all of his junior demons to come up with a plan to turn people away from God. Too many people were accepting the message of salvation. Too many people were getting right with God. So Satan asked all the junior demons to come up with a plan. One of the demons stood up in front of the others and said, I've got a plan. When I get to earth and take charge of people's thinking, I'll tell them, There's no heaven, Satan replied. That's a good plan. Is there another? Well, a second demon stood up and said, I've got a plan. I'll tell them there's no hell. Satan replied, that's also a good plan. Is there another? Finally, a third demon stood up and said, I've got a plan, one I know you'll really like. When I get to earth, I'll tell them there's no hurry. And when Satan heard that one, that's the one he chose. There is no hurry. So what is the saving virtue if you're struggling with the sin of sloth? What is the antidote, if you will, if you're dealing with this sin? The answer is diligence. Diligence to serve every person as though you were serving Christ, to treat every task as if that was the most important, and to respond to every request with love, with passion, and with zeal. I don't know if you noticed, but the first line of our prelude read, 
It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Then in our opening hymn, the first line of the first verse read, like a candle flame flickering small in the darkness, and in just a few moments, we'll be singing our responsive hymn where in the first verse, the word appears, fan the fire of compassion once again. dramatic effect. As you go into this week, relight your candles. As you go into this week, turn off those snooze buttons. And as you go into this week, stop making excuses and serve with joy and passion again. And all God's people said, As we've been doing at the end of each sermon, we've been spending a moment saying a prayer of confession for this particular sin. It's a little too long to print in your bulletin, so we have it on screen. If you will join me now for a prayer of confession of sloth. Let us confess together. Lord, we confess we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. Uh, I think what's on screen is different than what I have. We'll continue. We have gone around blind, preoccupied, self-absorbed, lazy and prideful. Forgive us, O Lord, when we squandered your gifts. Forgive us, O Lord, when we were too busy to notice. Lord, lead us in the way of righteousness and cleanse us for your name's sake. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.